Let's open God's Word together uh, to the verses that we sang just a moment ago in Psalm 119. And our reading this morning will be verses 73 to 80. So let's uh, hear the Word of God together. 119, verse 73 and following. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be for my comfort according to your word to your servant. Let your tender mercies come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they treated me wrongfully with falsehood, but I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes, that I may not be ashamed. While the Psalms certainly embrace the praises and the prayers of all of God's people. There are many places in the Psalms where one voice rises up above all the rest, and we can distinctly hear the voice of our Savior. It happens many times when we're reading or singing the Psalms, and you hear that one voice proclaiming His righteousness, proclaiming His justice, speaking about His his ministry to all of God's people. And at these moments, we have the distinct impression that it is Christ who is singing the psalm and that we are all singing along in Him by faith. And this is why the New Testament refers to the psalms as the Word of Christ and commands us to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly by singing the psalms of the Bible. And His Word does indeed dwell in us richly when we sing in Him and by faith in Him. The voice of Christ is very distinct in different places in Psalm 119. And while the psalmist here offers many praises and prayers that make him an example of true faith for us to follow, he also at times pictures himself as the object of the faith of God's people. And it is at these moments that we hear the voice of our shepherd. We remember that Psalm 119, like all the psalms, is the word of Christ. And the purpose of this psalm is to direct our faith and our love toward Him. Throughout Psalm 119, Christ is the one who loves and keeps God's Word like no other. Now, in our passage today, in our scripture reading of these eight verses, there are two verses in particular that stand out in this way, and the way in which we distinctly hear the voice of our Savior. And In our short time this morning, we're simply going to focus on those two verses. They are verses 74 and 79. So first of all, let's turn our attention to verse 74 of our scripture reading. The verse says, those who fear you will be glad when they see me. Now, there's a general way to understand this verse, uh, to take it as the, the idea, the doctrine that all believers are glad to see one another. I'm glad to see you, you're glad to see me, hopefully, uh, whenever we encounter each other, because uh, we have a like precious, precious faith. But this verse does not frame that point in a general way. All believers are pictured as having a singular and mutual joy when they see this one man, the speaker of the psalm. It is clear that the joy and the hope of all of God's people is invested in him. All of us rejoice in Him when we see Him. Now, that's not exactly something that the average believer would say. I would not say, all of God's people rejoice when they see me. (laughs) I can think of some who probably don't rejoice so much when they see me. But this is true of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? We rejoice at the prospect of seeing Him. All of our joy together as God's people is invested in Him. Furthermore, it is the fear of the Lord that moves us to rejoice together in Christ. It says, those who fear you will be glad when they see me. 
So the natural corollary to the fear of the Lord, which is Old Testament shorthand for saving faith, love for God, the corollary of that, the natural consequences of, of that, of the fear of the Lord, is that we will all rejoice in this one man who can only be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he goes on to speak of the occasion of our joy in him and the reason for our joy in him. First of all, the occasion of our joy in him. It says, uh, those who fear you will be glad when they see me. That's the occasion of our joy in him, when they see me. Now, if we envision the speaker of these words as a mere human believer, why would it be such a noteworthy occasion to see him? However, what's being pictured here is, what's being implied here is that we have not yet seen him, and when we do see him, it will be a singular and unique occasion. It will be something anticipated, not an everyday occurrence, but something that we have looked forward to. Seeing him is going to be an event, isn't it? Why is it a big deal for us, an occasion for great joy of all of God's people, for us to see the speaker of this psalm? It is because the most precious promise of our Lord and the greatest expectation that you and I have is that one day we will see the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been promised that in his word. And we will be glad when we see him, will we not? Now, this was the joyful expectation of all Old Testament believers. Think of Job chapter 19. Job rejoiced in this one doctrine that one day when his, after he was raised up from the dead, what was his great joy and expectation? I will see him. I will see him with my own eyes. And this, this expectation is heightened under the New Covenant. 1 John chapter 3 says that we will one day see him as he truly is, and that is our great hope and our great joy. So this great hope and this great joy that we anticipate, amazingly, is described from Christ's perspective, and in his own words in Psalm 119, he says, those who fear you will be glad when they see me. In this verse, Christ, in his own words, promises that we will see him and that we will rejoice when we do. Now, let's think about the reason we will rejoice to see him. Uh, can you list the reasons you will rejoice to see Christ? Right? You can't list all those reasons. There are so many reasons why we will rejoice at that last great day. But one reason is given here, and here's the reason. Because I have hoped in your word. Here is one reason that you and I will rejoice to see the Lord Jesus Christ, because he hoped in God's Word. He was faithful. He trusted in God's Word. He never doubted the Father's promises to him and to us. Now that's no small thing. To get a sense of how glad you should be and how glad you will be that Christ hoped in God's Word, imagine for a second where we would be if he didn't. Where would you be if Christ didn't hope in God's Word. If he didn't hope in God's Word, you would be lost, you would be undone, and you would have no reason for hope. But this is a wonderful thing to think about. Among all the reasons that we will rejoice when we see the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be glad most of all that he hoped in God's Word. His hope will prove to be more than enough to cover over our doubts. And this is a great comfort to us even now. Have you ever doubted God's promises? Have you ever doubted his word? You're a believer, but have you ever felt in life that you have had that unquestionable hope or trust or assurance in God's word? Has there been uh, any fault, any defect in your hope at all in life? And the answer is yes, isn't it? This is true of all of us to some degree. You and I are very weak creatures. Our hope in God's word is not what it should be. So do not trust in yourself to have all the hope and trust that you will ever need. Your hope in God's word must and will grow, but it will never be perfect in this life. So trust in Christ. Trust in him. Believe in him and cling to him because it's he who says, I have hoped in your word, and his hope is perfect. His trust in God's word never wavered. He never doubted God's promises, not once. So if your hope is weak, cling to Christ. 
His hope is perfect, and in His hope, you will find hope. You will find hope as well. And when you see Him at last, on that last great day, when you are raised up at the resurrection, you will rejoice, not because of the hope that you've had, but you will rejoice because Christ hoped in God's Word. By faith in Him, you will see how the hope of Christ is more than enough to cover over your own doubts and fears. Now let's go on now to verse 79, and let's consider this verse. And this verse is just as striking as verse 74. Verse 79 says, Let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. Now once again, just like verse 74, this verse begins by identifying God's people in the same way. Those who fear the Lord. Listen to it again. Let those who fear you turn to me. Just as it was in verse 74, those who fear you will be glad when they see me. Now it's those who fear you will turn to me. Identifying, once again, God's people as those who fear him. And once again, this verse identifies a natural and a necessary corollary to the fear of the Lord. Those who fear you turn to me. These are two things that must of necessity go together. If you fear the Lord, if you believe in the one true God, you must and you will turn to the one who speaks these words, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is an unbreakable equation here of cause and effect or of condition and consequence. Those who fear you turn to me. The fact is that a person cannot know God or love God or fear God in any true sense without turning to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. The Apostle John put it this way in 1 John chapter 2, verse 23. He said, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. And he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Now the Son of God takes that point and puts it in his own words in Psalm 119, verse 75. He says, let those who fear you turn to me. Who else could say that? And this is it, isn't it? This is the call of the gospel in its irreducible form. This is, in fact, a summary of the Bible itself, the summary of the gospel. And it is God's calling to you today and to people everywhere. If you want to know God, if you fear God, you must turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you must have faith in Him. You cannot know God, much less fear Him as you should, or have faith in Him without turning to Christ. Now, what is envisioned by this phrase, turn to me? Those who fear you, turn to me. Well, the Hebrew verb that's used here, the verb shuv, and my Hebrew students know that one well, don't you? Um, it means to turn or to return. It's used in narratives too, in just simple common narratives. Uh, Abraham might go somewhere and then he returns, right? And then that's the verb shuv. That's how it's used in narratives. But it is predominantly used as a metaphor for a spiritual act, the spiritual act of turning away from something, i.e. sin, and turning to the Lord for forgiveness, turning to him in faith. So it's very much a theological word. It's, yes, it depicts a physical action very often, but it depicts a spiritual act even more often, this, this word to turn to the Lord. Many times in the Bible, especially in the prophets, God calls his people and all people to turn to him. And this is the most often verb used in those contexts. It envisions repentance from sin, right? a turning from something and a turning to something. Turning from sin and turning to the Lord in faith. Let me give you a for instance. Uh, in Joel 2, verse 12, the Lord says, Turn to me with all of your heart. What does that envision? It means repentance and faith, doesn't it? And he uses this verb, shuv. And by, by putting it that way, he's calling people to faith and repentance from sin. 
So when Psalm 119, verse 79, that we've read here, uses this same phrase, turn to me, no mere man can say that in the Bible. Who could say that? Turn to me. Those who fear you will turn to me. Who could say that but God himself? We know that no mere man can say that. Only the Son of God, who is God, and who has the authority of God, can say, turn to me, and expect men to do it. And this is indeed the very essence of true faith, turning to Jesus Christ in faith and repentance. And all who fear the Lord will turn to him and keep turning to him day by day. The book of Proverbs famously says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But here I think we have a sense of what is the beginning of the fear of the Lord, and that is to turn to Jesus Christ. Now, verse 79 ends with a kind of uh, addendum, if you will, that further describes those who fear the Lord and turn to Christ. There's, there's just one more thing to say about them. 79, those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. Now, this brings us back to the main theme of Psalm 119, which is how the Word of God is such an important blessing in the life of faith. It is so important that this verse connects it to the fear of the Lord and turning to Christ. And who are these people? These are the ones that know his testimonies. These are the ones that know his word. Those who fear the Lord and turn to Christ in faith, that becomes their desire. Right? To know the testimonies of God, to, to take his word in and write it upon their hearts. And to have it with them as a guide for life. This is all part of what it means to turn to Christ. We must desire to know his testimonies and strive to know them day by day. So in conclusion, these verses give us something to look forward to and something to do today, right now, and every day. The thing to look forward to is that we will see Christ and that we will rejoice because he has hoped in God's word. And that is a great reason for praise today, just to contemplate that fact. Let that fact sink into your soul just a little bit, that Christ hoped in God's word, and that will be your joy on the last great day when you see him, to know that his hope has been perfect. It means our salvation, and it means that we have hope. But in the meantime, what do we do? We turn to Jesus Christ. That's what this psalm calls us to do, to turn to him. Now, maybe you have. You have turned to Christ. You're a believer, and uh, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have to understand that turning to Christ is not a single event in life. It's not one date in the past that you look back on with nostalgia, and people ask you, when did you, you know, you, you do this in your testimony. When did you come to Christ? When did you turn to him? Well, it was August 9th, 1993, whatever. And uh, that was the day you turned to Christ. It doesn't work that way. Praise God if there is one day that you can look to. But this is the task of every day. I mean, this is a lifelong calling. This is not something you do once and then just sit back and contemplate it with some nostalgia. This is a call that comes to you every single day. Turn to Jesus Christ. It envisions a daily seeking after him to grow in faith and love and obedience for him. Turning to Christ is a daily calling. So turn to him today, tomorrow, the next day, because Christ himself says, those who fear you turn to me. Let's pray. Father, give us the strength and the grace to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, to turn to him day by day. And uh, Father, it gives our hearts great joy to think about uh, that time when we will see him with our own eyes, uh, that time when we will all rejoice together because finally we will see him and we will rejoice because he has hoped in your word. And Father, our hope is in him. And so give us greater hope. Give us greater faith in Christ. Help us to turn to him day by day. All these things you have commanded us from your word. Now give what you command, we pray. Give us the strength to respond to your word in faith. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.